So thank you very much uh, for staying with us. So as, uh, as I said just before, we will now start this uh, last workshop for today for track one, which will focus uh, on how to ensure the best articulations of funds to leverage, of course, what we are already very familiar with, the Portugal space strategy, which as we all know, is very ambitious and uh, we all have to collaborate surely together with national and international partners, putting together uh, different sources of funds to be able to, to make it a success. And this workshop is exactly to discuss this uh, context a little bit, try to get some uh, perspectives, some different uh, important players within this strategy. And of course, uh, at the end, to get some questions from the public and try to to make this conversation as enthusiastic as possible. So to start, uh, we have a, a full uh, a full uh, panel. So I just ask everyone to be uh, to be on time with their presentations so that we can actually have uh, a Q and A session at the, at, the, at the end. So first, I would like to introduce Luis Chirino, who is a project manager at Portugal Space, and uh, it will sh uh, show us uh, overall what is the strategy for Portugal Space, their vision in terms of what can be done uh, for uh, achieving their ambitious uh, strategy. So Luis Chirino, please go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, uh, Rui. Can you hear me well? Thank you very much for, for this invitation uh, and good afternoon to the panel colleagues. It's very good to, to be here. Sure, it will be very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, uh, colleagues from the board uh, were not uh, available. Some are on mission today. They clearly have a, a very high level, good perspective on this topic, which is rather complex. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you the PT space perspective, of course, with uh, uh, some specificities of my vision. And so uh, you asked me to set the stage for, for this very uh, complex topic, uh, indeed. Uh, where do we get the funding? How do we articulate that? Uh, what, what are the, the issues with that? So I think it's uh, very useful to, to have a session like that. And, and I guess uh, the, the panel colleagues some of them have very relevant perspectives on the barriers or on the challenges that we're trying to solve here. So when I was asked to state how to best articulate the funds, uh, I, was, uh, I spent a couple of hours thinking about that. It's really complex. And so I came up with a, a recipe, it's a, a bit naive, and some ingredients. I, I, how should we do that? And why is it now a better time to do this than probably in the past where there has been a constant evolution of space in Portugal? And so to have these, these funds articulated, most of us who are here already for some years, we know the difficulties. So it's important to have this articulation. Uh, I would say first that we have high level empowerment. So uh, political uh, support to this. And indeed, this is a, a question that the, the minister has raised and uh, has put this uh, question on the table. And I guess it's also a reason why we are discussing this now. Also, we need, of course, a, a shared strategy. So we have this Portugal space uh, strategy. It must be shared. So the different institutions, stakeholders, they, they need to embrace it, to believe it. And of course, this uh, strategy is also evolving and we have a uh, an updated version already in our website. I'm sure some elements you've heard throughout this session. We need the, uh, also, it is key to have a, a very strong implementing agency we now have with the Portugal space, which is trying to put together all the different interests and, and the uh, stakeholders around the development of space in Portugal. We need also uh, supporting stakeholders, namely the key the key stakeholders, and we see on the table Professor Maldonado from ANI, which I think is a, a very good sign, uh, an important stakeholder in, in some of the major funding uh, programs in Portugal. I would also add to have clear goals, uh, a clear work plan and priorities. Of course, in the strategy, we are aware that it covers many possibilities, many ambitions. And of course, we, we should focus 
when we want to have uh, results and high impact, we know that we have to cover many, many activities, but, but we should prioritize and, and this should be clear to, to all uh, representatives and, and the entire community. Of course, the easy one is a committed community that, that uh, we have for, for 10, 20 years. The core of space sector has been there and it has been growing with the startups. Uh, also at the level of research entities, universities. So this is uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, has been quite stable. And finally, of course, as I started, we have to recognize that this articulation of funds is a really complex uh, task. Uh, you have to understand that uh, the major funds are, are managed by different entities, uh, some in Portugal with their own missions, some European or intergovernmental, where we have to articulate with other member, member states uh, how the, the funds must be managed. So it's, it's quite difficult that when we want to uh, have these funds committed to the projects that we, we want. So and here I'm talking about these, I'm talking about the European Commission, I'm talking about ESO, uh, SCA and whatever. So uh, this is just the, the first slide, so I hope I still have a lot of time. No, I won't take much. Of so now I'll, I'll, give, uh, I'll give some uh, elements uh, about uh, what we're doing in each one of these uh, aspects that I've mentioned. So, of course, the, the, the vision and the space strategy we all know, as we mentioned in, in the beginning. So, and this has been involving the stakeholders. So, I guess it was key for PT Space to have as stakeholders very relevant national entities which manage and uh, enforce important budgets, either FCT in the part of science, ANI for the structure of funds, but also the defense. Uh, the agency has been working more and more closely with the defense so that uh, we uh, can uh, both use in synergy the defense and civil uh, funds when that makes sense. And of course, the regional uh, governments of Azores and Madeira, which also uh, are strategic for the agency. And so clear goals, that's something that we also have. These numbers have been uh, presented already uh, sometimes. Uh, these are ambitious uh, numbers as everyone recognized to create mil 1,000 uh, skilled jobs uh, to increase the private uh, uh, funding of the sector. And it's good to see that Armilar is in this panel, which is for sure uh, will be part of uh, trying to increase the, the private investment. And of course, to have an overall investment of 2.5 uh, thousand million euros in 10 years, which is, a, a, we all recognize, is a significant number, but it's something that we'll try to achieve. Uh, but, but having these clear goals, I guess it makes it e easier to, to have this so clearly shared amongst uh, the community. Uh, I think it makes it easier so that everyone is aligned uh, towards what uh, uh, the country wants to do in space. So in comparison uh, between 2019 and 2030, uh, in addition to what I said before, we want to create more new companies. We want 500 million Euro, uh, euros per year in turnover, which is consistent. As it was mentioned in the previous section, this uh, system and subsystem leadership in order to create products and that Portugal takes more added value out of the, the space ecosystem. These are uh, important uh, aspects. And now maybe uh, the core of the issue. So um, we ask where, where do we get uh, this funding? How do we articulate? Uh, so th this matrix is, is quite complex. So sometimes it's even scary to look at it, but it uh, gives us a very good idea uh, where we'll try to get the money in some of these, uh, 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 these programs and entities, the money is there and it will come to Portugal. For instance, in ESA, we have geo return. So uh, we'll, we'll have uh, a large share of this uh, budget coming to Portugal to, to projects, but on other uh, uh, fully competitive programs, this could be more challenging and uh, we have to do a very huge effort, even huge 
even bigger effort to, to, to get it. And what the minister has said is in, uh, more than getting more budget that for sure we all want, we also want that this budget is articulated. We want that uh, the money we get from the commission or from either they both work to fund the objectives that uh, I mentioned before. And so it's to uh, 250 million per year that we want as a, a turnover uh, from these programs. We, if we do the accounts, this is quite complex, as I said. So I would highlight Horizon Europe will be a, an important program. The European Space Program, which is, uh, has been monopolized by the big primes in Portugal, but also the defense programs. There are uh, a lot of discussions on these defense budgets and it's a, a big opportunity for Portugal uh, to be positioned there. I also see then, I'm talking in the columns, you have the different uh, uh, programs which will fund. Then we have the, the structural funds, which more recently have been more and more supportive of space with the mobilizadores. And I would, uh, in the end, highlight the, the markets, which is uh, with the new space trend more and more, uh, there are expectations that, that uh, this market will take off. And we see that uh, we have, for instance, in commercial markets, 76 million per year. So we, we see that compared to uh, current numbers, this is quite high. I, in the end, would also uh, take a note for the FCT, we have FCT uh, with its own budget and we have ESA. So for ESA, we have, ha we have a number, it's not just the FCT contributing, we have Anacom and others. And FCT is also supporting ESO, SCA, and other intergovernmental organizations which are part of these numbers. So let's continue. So we see that in, in the previous ministerial, uh, we have uh, increased the budget in ESA, which uh, in the previous metrics, we have a target of 25 million per year. So we're uh, close to achieving 20 million per year. And it has been increasing since uh, 2011 when we had this crisis. So now, now this part that I'll go next, is about the great challenges that uh, I think uh, we uh, are getting to know them more and more as the Space Agency has been sharing them. So I'll go briefly also to not steal too much time to the discussion in the end. The one is the digital planet, which is about extracting the value supporting the infrastructure and technologies to extract value out of the data, namely satellite data, but not only that. So this is a key goal, which we want to see funded through the several sources mentioned before. The 5G, it's also now, it's also trending worldwide. So that we see a big push in this direction. Uh, see ESA, for instance, also, creating a, a, a growing program to, to fund the satellite component. I'll also skip that uh, uh, briefly. The Space Innovation Hub in Santa Maria, which uh, involves, of course, the micro, micro launcher, uh, which we're, we're trying to have it from Santa Maria, as well, the, the landing of the, the Space Rider, this is a, a re-entry vehicle for microgravity um, research experiments. But also we want to uh, somehow uh, around these uh, flagship projects to create an ecosystem of tech startups. I, I left it for the last uh, great challenge, the Atlantic Constellation is the most important. So the previous panel, it was uh, discussed. Uh, it was discussed. So I guess you heard a lot about that. Of course, in the, the first uh, one of the panels before, you also heard about the macro launcher. And here it is a, a, an example and a challenge how to fund it. And it is where this problem is most uh, more, more clear. So the, the, the constellation, it will have a cost which is uh, considerable concerning the investments Portugal has been making in space in ESA. And so we'll try to, to, to um, develop it through different sources. So now we're starting through ESA in Incubed the requirements study. We're expecting that uh, some of the mobilizadores will be contributing to that uh, in an even more articulated way. But we're also uh, uh, using international partnerships 
So this is where the, the complexity takes shape uh, in the form of a very specific goal. And, and that's where we'll face a, a reality. One last word to, to, to again talk about these mobilizadores, which have been more and more important uh, for the space strategy and their articulation with other funding sources. I guess it has been involving too well, Professor Maldonado for sure will we'll address those. I also uh, added the good examples of this articulation of funds in a more European level, which is uh, the Copernicus. As you probably know, Copernicus is funded both from ESA and the European Union. And Portugal has been very successful in, in this articulation where we have uh, subscribed to the ESA program allowing that uh, we got more than double the, the funding invested through ESA by getting also our share in the European uh, Union fund. So this is an example, not for a goal, a very specific goal from the space agency, but a goal to grow our sector and, and to participate in the major European uh, contracts. And so final slide, sorry that uh, uh, it's been taking too long. I know that uh, you've prepared some questions, but uh, I also leave my own. These are questions that we are always thinking and we have to understand which are the key questions. Uh, I, I leave some of them. Uh, and for sure, in view of this, the complex program, I would highlight from this question that uh, we, we should focus then the, the discussion. It's now good to hear the different perspectives from the, the panel colleagues. So I think it's with the specific cases that it's easier to, to, to move forward also to, to try to, to get a better understanding of the overall picture, which is very complex to play. And that's uh, as I, how I finish. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Luis, for the, the, the clear explanation in terms of what are the main strategic pillars and uh, the overall strategy in terms of the harmonization of funds. As we, as we saw, it's a very diversified. It, of course, as you mentioned, will have to be, um, you have to be ensure a, a, a good collaboration between partners. And in that context, I pass the word to Professor Eduardo Maldonado, which is present at ANI. And as we have seen through that table, uh, a lot of these uh, things will, of course, uh, go through also ANI. So, of course, uh, we, it's very interesting to have your perspective and how do you see this and how do you see that ANI is uh, willing and able to collaborate within this global, uh, global strategy. Please go ahead, Professor. Good afternoon. I, I hope you are hearing me and seeing me because I, I, don't, I don't see myself, so I don't know if I'm going through. Okay. But it is, first of all, a pleasure to be here, and I thank the organizers for giving us a chance to convey a little bit our message to, to everybody. And uh, following on the last presentation by Louise, you already see what the overall picture is for Portugal and the space. Uh, it is one of our national priorities, the government priorities. And uh, we are very glad that we have a plan. Uh, but this plan, as uh, was also explained by Louise, is quite recent. Uh, it's about few months, let's say, a few months old, was launched really and completed very recently. And uh, ANI has been funding projects for space and other related sectors, but also for space for many, many years. 
Uh, and so I will address that uh, lack of sync, let's put it this way, between what we have funded and the goals that we have. Uh, space is, of course, a major priority for, for ANI. ANI, we have two main missions, basically. We have so far one mission, which is to promote innovation, and we promote innovation in a transversal way in all fields. Space is just one of them. Uh, we do it horizontally. If you are familiar with the calls that, uh, that we finance, uh, we usually don't have specific topics. They are fully open and the stakeholders came in and make proposals, they, they, they get funded. Uh, and in this respect, I would like first to, to say that uh, I've made a very quick search of projects approved. And if I go back five, six years ago, I mean, uh, Luis showed the 2019, but before that we already had projects. If I go to five years ago, I'd find half a dozen projects in space. Uh, always with the same participants, <laughs> uh, different geometry. And right now, 2020, we have dozens of projects on space. Uh, we had, of course, a special call uh, for international projects with, the, with American universities. We have the big projects like the mobilizadors, like uh, Louise mentioned that we had, uh, I think, three approved in the area of space. We just approved another extra three on uh, international cooperation. So we are trying to uh, indeed uh, give a priority to space in terms of funding and promotion. And in terms of promotion, let me say that we need to do something. You've seen one of the slides that Louise has shown that he had, they, there is the plan, there is the view, and then several projects filling in the gaps. But I think there are a little bit ma too many gaps that the current projects can do without some readjusting. And so in that respect, we, uh, we were at a meeting a few weeks ago with all the projects related to space. So we promoted together with uh, was PT space that promoted and participated. And our message to the project was that we are open to realign the projects and restructure the projects, of course, within the constraints that exist from the financing rules that we have, those we cannot avoid. And we'd like to have them really work together and we'll try to promote meetings of the project so that we, uh, I don't want to use the word cluster in the wrong way because this is promoted by a different type of cluster, <laughs> the AED cluster. But uh, what I mean is a cluster of space related projects that we try to combine into a uh, logical se sequential, trying to fill the gaps and making them, getting the synergies out of those projects. And uh, I think that uh, there is a quite good probability that uh, at the end we can fill most of the gaps, but probably not all. Uh, and let me switch then to the future because we all know now that we have, let me use the, code, the, the word that is now most well known for the new programs, the European programs coming in, we have the bazooka. <laughs> we have the big funds that are coming in. Uh, we have, uh, of course, also the next framework program for, for structural funds, the PT 2030. And we have the European Horizon Europe that will follow up on uh, Horizon 2020. So we have uh, a series of new programs that uh, we must really take profit of those of those uh, funds of sort sources of money because it is important money as you know that uh, is coming we multiply in the number the yearly budget for for portugal just from european funding by a factor of at least three for the next two or three years so it is a big challenge 
And uh, just looking at the numbers that uh, Louise also shown, like the increase in uh, manpower, basically, or I should say people power, because we also li would like to have uh, a lot more women in the, in the field. It is, uh, I think it is a field that is rather unbalanced from a gender point of view. So th that there's a lot of work to do there. There's a lot of opportunity. But uh, I think that uh, we need to harmonize, and that's what we're doing. We're trying to harmonize and work together with PT Space and the government and the, the FCT and all the other funding entities, and of course also with defense and the regional government uh, for Madeira, SURS, and uh, our, I don't want to call it regions because they're not regions, although we call it regions in the, in the mainland. But uh, we're working together so that we have a logical, combined way of promoting. And I hope that we can uh, come up with a, a consistent program that will not have gaps and that will focus on a grand objective like the Constellation and others. Uh, and we are promoting that in a, in so our, our mission, more than just giving out the money, is to work together with PT Space and to get more stakeholders, more people involved, new stakeholders, uh, and of course, making all the stakeholders work, work together towards this common goal. It's not going to be easy. It's a great challenge. Uh, you've seen the numbers that uh, Louise shown with the, the, the amount of funding and number of jobs. Uh, we have to ask ourselves if we have enough people. We need young people, but we also need uh, people that, that will come into this sector. And we know that uh, all the graduates from the universities from, from the sector of aeronautics and space are gobbled up by the industry and there is no unemployment, let's put it this way, in this sector. And uh, therefore, the, the, big, uh, the big challenge and uh, something that we are also tackling together is to find, uh, to, to create those people, to make them come uh, available to the, to the market and to, because without the people, we can't have the money, we cannot do anything. We need the people to spend the money, the resources, and we need an exponential growth. And so we probably will have to also look at attracting uh, qualified um, foreigners, basically people from other countries that are willing. So we need to create, uh, and this is my, my final word, we need to create a vibrant sp space ecosystem in Portugal to promote innovation, to promote new products, to have dynamic uh, industry, to have also the universities and research centers combined in their uh, mission. And uh, I think the perspectives are good, but uh, we cannot uh, rest on our laurels. We need to work hard. And uh, I hope that 10 years from now, because I saw the target is 2020, I know the target is 20, 2030, I mean, uh, 10 years from now. 10 years from now, we'll be there, we'll reach, because probably 10 years ago, nobody thought that we'd be where we are at today. So I'm very positive that 10 years from now, uh, I'll be there to see the progress and see the, what the, the, the space community came up with. And, uh, from our part, we'll try to do our best to, to help nurture that ecosystem and make it evolve and uh, cooperate. Okay? Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Ivar Maldonado. I really love uh, um, listening to people saying intelligent things. So it was a, a pleasure to, to, to hear you talk about uh, strategy and, uh, of course, being aware of the challenge that we had to execute this strategy. A lot of them are also related to human resources. So uh, thank you very much for giving that uh, very interesting overview. Uh, we, of course, as it was mentioned by the previous speakers, have to be intelligent in terms of using all the available tools. And so uh, we thought it would be interesting and it would be the next, uh, the next, uh, the next speaker will focus on ESO, which as you all know, uh, is a program that uh, Portugal is also very much involved. Uh, and uh, it's something that is not being used to its full potential by the, the Portuguese, uh, Portuguese uh, uh, entities. So it is something that we take the opportunity to show a little bit more. And uh, Paulo Garcia, uh, which is uh, Professor Ed Philp and the National uh, point, uh, point of contact for this project will show how, uh, how we can, uh, what it is really about and how we can take more advantage to use this program exactly to these overall objectives that we all have in trying to push up the national strategy. So, uh, Professor Paul Garcia, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to talk you a little bit about um, an organization that is well, uh, well known for some of us and less well known for others. And this is the European Southern Observatory. And uh, the, the European Southern Observatory is an intergovernmental organization. It has 16 member states and Portugal joined in 2001. And what is uh, ESO about? So ESO uh, has headquarters in Munich and builds and operates the most advanced telescopes of the world, and mainly in the optical infrared and some on millimeter uh, in collaboration with, uh, with, uh, with global partners. And uh, ESO infrastructures are based in Chile, in the Atacama Desert, where the conditions on our planet are best to observe the deep universe. And currently, uh, ESO is building the largest and most advanced telescope in the world. This is the LT. This is a, uh, a picture depicting the size of this telescope, a huge structure that is dealing with very fundamental and um, uh, revolutionary scientific questions. And it is important to show you that this picture is reality. So this is not uh, being built. It's, these are very advanced deep space ranging uh, observatories with lasers that are uh, obtaining the most uh, deep uh, uh, measurements of space in the optical infrared. And this is one telescope where you see the sky from, uh, from below. And when you see from above, you see that you have this platform where, where the telescopes, these giant telescopes are, are being based. And uh, here I will, I will I, I will tell you that it's really fantastic to, uh, to be in this platform and, and, and conduct observations. And basically, this is a, an organization that has, um, uh, that has infrastructures. Portuguese scientists use infrastructures in a competitive basis. And uh, this is also a market for Portuguese companies. And I will go to this a little bit later. So what is the, the delegation, uh, uh, the Portuguese delegation in the in ESO? So we have the council where, where we have Ricardo Conde from PT Space and myself. Then we have the finance committee that is the industrial liaison with Luis that was just speaking uh, uh, a few minutes uh, before. And then some scientific and users committee that are more related to scientists and the use of the infrastructure. And I just like to, to highlight that the scientific participation is a success. If you use a metric that is how much we pay to the, to the organization and how much we get from the organization from competitive calls, uh, and I must say that is in ESO there is no just return, you pay and you are not guaranteed to get uh, uh, infrastructure use. You have to compete, you have to be excellent to get to the, and we in Portugal, have a very good return above one. We receive more than what we pay. Of course, it depends a little bit on the specific infrastructures you are getting, 
For example, we have a, a big peak here, and these are the planet guys. We have a very strong planet group, and is getting a lot from what we pay. And um, it, it is a success, our, 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 our scientific contribution and, and use of the infrastructures. And I, I, I can simply not, uh, uh, not forget uh, to call your attention to the Nobel Prize that was yesterday. And there was Portuguese brains behind it and Portuguese industry behind this and Portuguese payload behind it. So I'm just showing you uh, the machine that it was part of the of the of the one of the enablers of the of the Nobel Prize. This is the gravity machine, the gravity payload, and uh, this part here of the gravity payload was was built in Portugal and is and is and is uh, in, uh, and, and, and contributed to the to the results that uh, what you are getting. And we are involved also in the scientific exploitation. And the, in the Nobel Prize winners, that is, there are Portuguese people involved, and I'm very proud of it. But I would like also to have industries involved. And I think it's very important for industries to be part of this big, um, big race for discovery, because as those companies that are participating in it know, it can really enable uh, uh, added market and added capacity. And uh, what is the, the, the basically the challenge that we are facing with ESO? And the challenge is, is, is to increase the, the industrial return. And I'm going to just to show you here in this picture, what is the, the engine? I see these international organizations like ESO, CERN, SKA, and others as, as an engine. This is an engine. And basically they are pumped by national funding that uh, is the, the diesel of these engines or the electric or the green energy, if you want to be modern. Uh, and what uh, is, is, is happening also is that there are interaction with research units. And these research units are basically uh, enabling science and exchanging with, uh, with the infrastructure. And I would like to tell you, probably you are not aware, but the space sciences is the area in Portugal with highest impact uh, of all the areas. If you go to the statistics, you will see this. And of all areas of science, uh, uh, this is on top. And at the end, the infrastructure to operate requires procurement. And the procurement goes to national uh, companies. So this is really a very a good way to spend public money because it enables science, it enables uh, training of human capital. And in the end, you are enabling the national industry, the compet it's competitive and developing of advanced products. So this is really good use of taxpayer money. And I have here some examples of companies that have contracts with ESO. Some of them are associates of the EAD cluster. So how can we, can we increase, increase the, the, the industrial uh, participation in ESO? So we can only increase it if we are competitive. So this is, there is no just return as, as in ESA. You have to be competitive. You have to go there and take the stake. No one is going to do you a favor. So if we scientists are already doing that, uh, I firmly believe that uh, the industry is able to do that. I, I'm a scientist. I work in a in university. And I actually think that industry is more competitive than our uh, academic institutions. Uh, and we have another problem that is small numbers. Portugal is a small country. And small numbers mean we have a small number of procurements that where Portuguese industries are competitive. We have a small number of companies that are able to get one procurement because you don't really don't have an ecosystem where you can play the game several times and you can be competitive and it, it will be your major interest. And therefore, uh, we need to, to sort this out and we cannot sort it directly because this is against the competition uh, rules. So we have to be more clever than that. Than that. And so I will uh, just leave some time for the others with, uh, with my idea, my contribution to this, um, to this debate. We need uh, uh, an intersectoral program enabling the space sector. It is really fundamental. Uh, the previous speakers already addressed it, Luis Serena, the, the importance of bringing several funding agencies. Uh, Professor Maldonado as one of the agencies with the head of one of the agencies. Uh, is very uh, sympathetic to, to our cause. But uh, my, in my opinion, we need to extend uh, a program that is uh, very interesting and that does not have a lot of funding, but it is very interesting in its nature. 
that is the ESA Protex program, which some of you already, already have, where we can fund R&D development and also payload instruments, instruments for, uh, for, for, uh, for space in, in, the, in the case of ESA, but I will say also instruments for uh, ESO telescopes and others, because I, I really think Portugal is too small country to focus only on, on one infrastructure, and we really should bring all these infrastructures together, ESO, SKA, and more recently, the EST uh, telescope where we participate. And I think that we should explore, of course, synergies in players in funding. It's very important to, to note that uh, all these infrastructures in ground in space have different uh, requirements in terms of engineering and products, and therefore the companies that are able to answer are more um, uh, diverse, so it is very important. And uh, as it was said by Professor Malonado, uh, human capital is of paramount importance. We, we really need to have human capital involved. I actually am a, um, a strong favor of having uh, human capital from companies in mobility into these international organizations. It's very important to have this, let's say, intelligence to live there, to work there, to work in the, in, the, in, in the international organization, and then to come back to our country. And the best way is not to support young people. The best way is to support older people that are already established in Portugal and can return when will return because they have a strong anchor in Portugal. These people are in companies. We know that there is a huge industrial crisis uh, because of the COVID. And I must tell you that I've seen lots of people from different backgrounds operating here, civil engineers. You will say, oh, it's impossible civil engineer to operate in a, in a space space industry. It is of course possible because you have this engineering uh, uh, genome and the engineering genome is the enabler. Once you have this genome, you are able to think in the very specific way an engineer thinks. And this is very important to have this mobility. And so this program that was referred, as uh, Professor Mollen re referred the bazooka, I think we can really have uh, a way to involve highly skilled human capital whose industry is not able to absorb them anymore into the space sector international organizations. And finally, I really think that the selection should be based on excellence. We cannot play the game of avoiding excellent. If you are not good and don't play the excellent game, you don't have a chance nowadays, but we should all also play the game of return. You know, you have to just tick these two marks. And finally, I would like to, uh, to challenge AD Cluster to be a, a stakeholder in, into this effort, you know, to, to take the flag, to, to come, uh, come out and, uh, and, and uh, and, and take this challenge uh, of ESO and all these ground-based observatories where Portuguese participates. And I end, in, uh, end here, I'm sorry for taking two minutes more than I was supposed to. Thank you very much, uh, Paul Garcia, for your ex uh, clear explanation on uh, what is uh, the ESO, uh, ESO program and about the opportunities and challenges that we have. For sure, AED Cluster takes that uh, challenge with uh, very willingly. And uh, of course, I hope this is uh, this could be the kickoff for a, a closer collaboration, which uh, we are very much uh, engaged and we'll uh, follow up on that uh, right after uh, AD Day. So thank you very much again. Uh, I think it, it made clear about the opportunities we have with the ESO program. 
So we are running a little bit late. It's not completely our fault. Uh, it was 10 minutes. So I think we will finish 10, 15 minutes uh, after the, the time. I hope you can stay with us. And uh, I will pass along now to Tiago Cubelo uh, from SEIA, which will try uh, to give us, uh, we are talking about funding. Professor Eduardo Maldonado is talking about they have to have a strategy in terms of technology, mitigating the gaps. And Tiago will exactly uh, focus a little bit on that and give us an overview of the projects we have and how we can try to collaborate together. I think that is the key word in order to be able to really reach the markets with the competitive products. So, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. We are running out of time, so I'll try to keep within the 10 minutes. Uh, I must say that uh, after uh, Luisa's recipe and, uh, and uh, Maldonado's uh, uh, overview, uh, a few words remain for, for, for those that have to, to put this operationally. So I very much enjoy with uh, Luis's uh, recipe, but I think his questions at the end of the slides are actually quite the trick because those questions are the ones that we'll have to answer if we really are going to organize ourselves and to collaborate together. So early in the day, there were two particular discussions, one about micro satellites and the other one about micro launchers. And I took those two topics to try and give examples on how can we uh, more than collaborate, it's really organize ourselves towards this common strategy. So I'll not, I'll not take time to talk about SIA. SIA is an engineering and product development center. So we have been working around for more than 20 years now. And I think our role is really to promote collaboration and to strike product development from Portugal. And that's what we hope to do for the space sector, where I must say we are kind of newcomers. So new space is a good thing for us because we are very much new into the space realm. Uh, we started working on this field only around 2016. And, um, and it was quite nice to understand the evolution of the companies and the players at large, because the strategy evolved from uh, the subsystems actually to the full system development. So I, I can say that back in 2016, um, there was kind of an harmonization between different institutes, different institutions in Portugal, um, most of them small companies or small research centers, because we are also a small country and, uh, and the previous speaker spoke about this. Um, but I think there was an understanding that if we, did, if we did not come together, we would keep on being the tier threes and tier fours for the big players. And the big players would come on coming to Portugal and basically use us as a way to subsidize their, their own strategies. And obviously we need to collaborate nationally, compete international. Sometimes we need to reach midterm, but it is obvious for, for me and for us that today we are much better prepared to deal and discuss on nearly equal terms with the big players around on the space on the space value. And it's, it's obvious that we cannot do everything alone. So this strategy is rather ambitious. There are things that Portugal might have a chance of doing by itself. There are things where it will have to collaborate. So having the Air Center, having the Plus Atlantic Collab, having all these international uh, uh, endeavors, it's a way to ensure collaboration. So since 2016, I would say our industry converged towards the developing of, of a possible integrator in the emerging new space value chains. Uh, if one thinks uh, about the past, uh, a dedicated strategy was put into place and it was that dedicated strategy around the Atlantic that gave birth to the Air Center, that gave birth to the Portuguese Space Agency, that later gave birth to the Portuguese Space Strategy, strategy 2030. So all of this, uh, 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 one should say, it did not start yesterday. Okay, uh, besides the 20 years uh, uh, that we have as a technology development, the strategy is already around for the last four or five years. And the strategy came really out of an alignment from the industry and the players that were on the ground by defining common areas to, 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 to work projects, by striking partnerships and by starting these projects themselves. So if, if we look at these four dimensions, I think we kind of evolved from dimension one, which is the subsystems and payloads, where I would say six, seven, eight years in the past, this is what was where we mostly were, to an ambition focused on platforms and infrastructures that started kind of five years ago, four or five years ago, and which is now starting to materialize with projects like the Infant, with projects that are reaching their final stages and, and will, will soon be launched, hopefully. But we also think out at the service perspective. We also need to think on how really to be the, at the forefront of the market, how to really 
have the high value chain. So I, I will not focus much on this because I think Luis really puts uh, very well the, the challenges that we have ahead. But I just want to say that we kind of evolved from dimension one towards dimension four. And if I have to say it up to date, we're kind of in the middle. So we already understand that we have to go to the services by, by putting together this perspective of the Atlantic constellation that Miguel Galo from the Air Center explains very well. We are already thinking on the services, not only institutional services, but also commercial services. But in the ground, we really need to put the assets, the technologies. What are we going to do? Are we going to do everything? Are we going to do subsystems once again? Are we going to call a big prime out of Europe or, or, or and, and call it to Portugal to, to work it out for us? What are we going to do? So more than the markets and the applications, which I think will more than explain, um, one needs to think of one, in the upstream, where can we contribute? What do we need to own? What can we buy and where can we cooperate? And on the downstream, uh, what are the services that we want to provide? Who are going to be the first customers, the anchor customers? Um, it, it is a good thing that we now have a Portuguese space agency that is not only composed by FCT, but that has ANI as well, and that has defense as well. So this gives us an opportunity to answer our own needs before answering the needs of the others at large. So I will focus on two examples here. One example, uh, I must say that five years ago, obviously, when 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 you were starting, you were you, you were trying to be uh, ambitious, and and we are still ambitious, which is a good thing, which is a nice quality of the Portuguese people. But then we need to put our foot on the ground and really have to work it out together. And sometimes we need to know uh, where to compromise. So. Five years ago, we wanted, uh, I must say, uh, almost everything. If, 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 if you look at our space strategy, well, we wanted to develop microsatellites, we wanted to develop micro launchers, we wanted to have all the data services on the downstream. And, and that's a good thing for a strategy. But then operationally, we need to have the funds, we need to have the resources, we need to have the manpower uh, to, to, to do that. And we need to look at our own size and understand that maybe we cannot do everything. So. If on the microsatellites, uh, it was clear that Portugal could have a chance, and that chance started with the Infant, and now with Magal, with the Eros, with uh, Astris, with all those projects, mobilizing projects and, and international projects, and now with the Incube uh, leading, leading, let's say, the way and paving the way for the requirements. Um, on the micro launchers, obviously, we, 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 we had to make use of, of our geographic location in the Azores. And we had to make use of that to position ourselves. So particularly for, for, for Saida, we tried to look at these opportunities from one perspective. What can we do? What are we good at? Because that's, that's the way to start. And um, where will we want to do everything by ourselves? Where will we want to cooperate? Where will we want to partner internationally? And the do it everything by ourselves was never on the table. So since day one, it was understood that for this space, for reaching products, we could not do it alone. That's why we started working with Tekever, with Omnidi, with FASEC, with many other companies that basically we established agreements for cooperation and collaboration. So particularly on, on the micro satellites, if we look at all the projects that we have today, and these are just projects where Saya ourselves are participating, but I would say there are, there are a few more. I think I have like 10 projects represented in the next 10 slides. And these 10 projects are projects both from funded by ESA, funded by mobilizing funds, funded through FCT, et cetera, et cetera. So one can see that most of these projects, they are focused on subsystems, but end up with a system integration. So how can we organize this? I'm very happy to hear that Ani is, is open and willing to, to converge and reorganize the projects, but we need not only to converge at the subsystem development, we need to converge towards common requirements. Because if in one project, the satellite is to be a 3U and in another project is to be a 16U and in another one is to be 150 kilogram satellites, then you will end up again with a lot of things, but nothing concrete that can lead you to the market. So, I think to maximize funds, we really need to consolidate efforts. And, and uh, consolidating efforts means compromising and means uh, defining primes. Uh, most of these projects, these R&D projects, mobilizers, they are quite difficult to manage, I should say, because their nature, it's to mobilize, okay? So they, they, they have the, uh, a strong um, set of partnerships, sometimes more than 20 partnerships, but the leader is not a prime. It's not the prime that we know from, from European projects. It's not the prime that we know from commercialized projects. So sometimes it's difficult. There is a lot of compromises and commitments, and there is a lot of uh, do's and don'ts, and don't step here, don't step there. So one good thing would be 
to try and really find a way to monitor these projects, not only from the deliverable perspective, but also from the impact perspective. Uh, how many jobs are going to be created? Uh, when will this project reach the market? What are we going to do with that? Because when the bazooka comes, if you are managing and monitoring deliverables, well, then we will have a big problem. So I think we also need to try and adapt the way we are monitoring the, the, the projects. And we also need to try and adapt our own entities to look at the project, not as, a, not as a, an ending itself, but as a means to achieve something. And if that something is a product where we will only have 20% of it, well, then be it. It's better to have 20% of something big that, well, a lot of nothing. Then on, on, on the micro launchers, particularly for us at Sayo, we had to, to partner and we decided to partner with a, a big player, uh, OHB Rocket Factory Augsburg, uh, which is developing their own micro launcher system and which we strike the partnership to develop the kick stage, the third stage out of Portugal and to integrate this third stage out of Portugal. Now, Obviously, there is the anchor of a possible client, and this is something that is good, but you also need to finance your own developments. You also need to contribute. And for that, there are many R&D projects that are also contributing toward this ending. And again, they will have to be consolidated because supply chains can erase out of this and primes can erase out of this. So just final message, running out of time here. Obviously, we, we learn from our past, we live our future, and, and we wish for a, we live our present and we wish for a better future. I would say that uh, we have more than 20 years of investment in space. For the first years, uh, it was mostly putting it and ease, bring it in back. Well, it didn't really matter what we were doing. We were still giving the first steps. We were learning. We were driving the, 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 the human resources. But now we have a strategic alignment, and this is unique between science policy and industry. Now we have, I would say, the gatekeepers. If we look at the Air Center, if we look at Portugal space, these are the guys that will ensure that this strategy doesn't change every three months. They are beyond politicians. They are beyond governments. This, these entities will exist to make sure that it's, this strategy for 2030 is going to be there. But we also need to evolve at our institutions level, at, at the operational level. So more than joining efforts towards, uh, let's say, uh, R&D projects, we really need to evolve towards an integrated position. So my take home message would be to, well, we need to align all, all efforts under the same strategy. And for that, Portugal Space, Air Center, the Plus Atlantic Collab, AED, ANI, FCT, and all these guys, they are quite important, but particularly PT Space, I think they are the guardians of, of the strategy. At a lower level, we need to consolidate between our institutions. Well, if, if, if I'm a part of a company that wants to do everything from A to Z, probably I will end up stepping on many, many people's toes. And probably I will keep on being small. So we need to organize ourselves to be bigger as, as a group. And then finally, we should not be afraid of establishing primes. Primes are the way that industry has developed all around the world. Primes are the way to ensure that there are value chains. Primes are the way to grow. So we have a lot of small to medium uh, uh, institutions and enterprises, but if we look at other countries, we lack a prime. And if we do not grow towards a prime or a couple of primes or, or, or whatever, we will not get critical mass. We will not be able to grow this value chain. And, and I think uh, Luis asked in one of his questions, what is missing? What's the lessons to learn from other countries? I think one is we are quite dispersed. And by being very much dispersed, we disperse resources. Because sometimes we are doing the same thing in different institutions. Sometimes we are going towards the same difficulties on different institutions. So we really should try and organize ourselves operationally, technologically, and establishing the primes. And those primes will take the lead, but everyone can participate. So um, stakeholders like AED are quite important to help us organize ourselves and to put this strategy together. Thank you. Cool. So thank you very much, Tiago, for the very good, uh, very good explanation. It's uh, it's very good to see that everyone has has uh, has it clear that uh, this is a collaboration effort, and we need to articulate ourselves 
very well in order to uh, be able to get into this very competitive market. So thank you very much. Uh, to end these sessions and because we are already a, a little bit out of time, so I will make this uh, Q&A sessions uh, together with uh, Rodolfo, uh, which uh, is from uh, the venture capital uh, Armilar. Uh, and so the objective of bringing him aboard was really, uh, I think uh, we have to be careful because all this family is very enthusiastic with space. No? That's, that's something that we will live. Uh, every day, so uh, it is good to have uh, um, a critical perspective in terms of what is happening uh, what, from the past, what we have now, and how to look into the future in terms of, of the capability to really go for. So maybe, uh, Rodolfo, maybe Armilar is uh, among the entities represented here is not so well known, so maybe just give some brief words about, uh, about what exactly do you do, how do you position yourself, and then I would see just uh, taking advantage also of your background. I mean, as uh, most of us know, you have been uh, also within this uh, space in this for a long, for a long time uh, with different uh, with the roles. So have a very good perspective in terms of public, private uh, perspective. So in terms of the VC venture capital, I mean, how do you see the evolution of space of activities since our, uh, starting participating in NASA? And what is being shown now, so a lot of change for sure, but in terms, uh, the real thing is the ability to use this in order to create products and services that can compete in what we know is the very competitive market. And one thing is looking at research and development efforts, and another thing is picking up this in bringing it to products and services that can compete. So maybe please go ahead with those two first uh, questions. Thank you. Sure. So thank you very much, Rui, and uh, hello to my fellow panelists and to whomever is watching. I have no idea if uh, we're talking to each other or if we have a huge amount <laughs> of people watching. So hello, everyone. Uh, very we have around 130 our... people. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Um, so very quickly, Armilar is a venture capital uh, firm. We have been around for 20 years. We're based in Lisbon. Actually, we started investing in the United States. Uh, 2000. And the reason is obviously that the ecosystem of startups was not as active as it is now uh, today in Europe. Uh, and we have progressively uh, come back to Europe and now we're actually uh, focused on, in Europe and, and uh, very early stage uh, and go on uh, deep tech startups. And so that's sort of like where we fit is, is in deep tech, which uh, differentiates us a little bit from most other VC uh, firms in Europe. Um, we particularly like to invest in uh, software businesses, uh, B2B software, uh, not necessarily exclusively, but that's uh, where we fit. Some of our most well-known investments include uh, OutSystems, FeedSeye, um, Cozy, and most recently within our fifth fund that we're now deploying, uh, which is a deep tech fund, a technology transfer fund. We're looking specifically at R&D organizations that want to spin off some of their technologies uh, and we've been investing in, in startups that spun off of um, Porto, um, A Coruña, for example, as well, uh, and many others. Um, and we have a second fund that we're deploying from, which is a 5G fund. So uh, I think it was Luis uh, who mentioned 5G a while ago. And, and so we're quite interested in looking at uh, 5G enabled uh, technologies. Uh, we manage about 260 million euros of assets. Um, and we're looking for startups. So I think it's, a, it's, very, uh, it's very nice to be here and, and see the new space uh, uh, sector emerging. So as to your second point, um, what happened for the last, uh, I, I would actually go back in time almost 25 years ago when I joined, uh, when I was admitted at IST, uh, Aerospace Engineering. We were not even uh, close to uh, joining ESA at that time. So when I graduated, we were, always, we were uh, already part of ESA. I was fortunate enough to do my young graduate traineeship at ESA. I stayed there for a couple of years. I came back, I worked for the uh, national delegation. I had the pleasure to work directly with Luis. Uh, I stayed there for a few years. And so then um, after a while, I also worked at Demos. Uh, so I do have that sort of like perspective. And one thing is, is um, you know, Professor Maradonado said we wouldn't dream 10 years ago that we were here. In fact, we dreamed about this 15 years ago. Um, so it, it's actually extraordinary to see that what we 
envisioned, uh, and I think actually was from the start, uh, is a succession. Uh, things are actually coming to fruit and, and it's, it's very rewarding to see from the outside. And I'm sort of like itching that I'm not in the inside these days, <laughs> but um, it's extraordinary what has happened. Uh, and I think, I think there, we are at a sort of a pivotal moment, I, I would suggest, which is that we have grown as much as we can in the paradigm that existed uh, 2000 to, I don't know, maybe 2015 or 16, like Chuck said, it's not <clears throat> one or two years old, this strategy is, is a few, it's a bit older than that. And we're really trying to change significantly what we've done. And the reason is simply that we cannot grow more the way we were growing. And so what you see is, you know, like Tiago explained extremely well, you have this shift on, on the, the value chain we put ourselves into. And that's, that's really important. I think that's uh, probably the basis for everything else. But I, I would suggest that there's a second, uh, second aspect to, to the change that is either happening or needing to happen, which is, to go into uh, beyond the, the envelope of space sector, at least the institutional uh, space sector. And that's a bit tougher, I think, because uh, most of our uh, companies in Portugal and, and research institutes have become incredibly proficient at uh, winning grants and awards and ESA contracts and, and EU contracts. And, and that's extremely valuable. Don't get me wrong, I think it's, it's, it's the basis for everything else. Changing from being extremely good at uh, uh, winning contracts with ESA to being a commercially viable, successful ecosystem is really different. And here's what I what I think about when you ask about the VC perspective and going forward. And I'm very optimistic. Let me say, um, here's what I think needs to happen. There are two ways to go. Either there is um, financing for space activities from space focused funds. And I'm thinking about, you know, the likes of Seraphin and others who are very much focused on, on space. And that's one option. And these are not mutually exclusive. And the other is to just go into the wild market of, uh, you know, investment funds that are looking for a good return on investment period and are sort of agnostic whether or not the, the startup is uh, space born or not. Um, and so that's where startups, and I think we do need a lot of new players in the ecosystem. system. And I can talk a bit of what I'm seeing in Spain where we get contacted. Um, I've actually been contacted recently by more than one Spanish company uh, acting in space, uh, in Spain, space in Spain. Um, and, and some of these guys are former uh, employees of established space companies that have decided to go out and start their own businesses in a really, really, uh, different mindset, which is I'm going to raise money to get this product out and, and I'm, I want to sell to uh, end users or uh, businesses, not uh, get uh, visa contracts or whatever. And so this is not good or bad. I'm saying that this is a shift I'm seeing in Spain. I'm guessing that there is a lag and therefore uh, it's my feeling that we'll be seeing this here in, in Portugal uh, sooner or later, which is these really talented people who want to break out and, and sort of like go into a mode that is a bit different from what our space companies are doing. Uh, and so what will happen is that these startups will compete with any other startup looking for uh, financing. And when they do that, it's very good that they bring their space capabilities on board, but they will be competing with, you know, low code tools, developer tools, whatever it is um, that is out there. And for an investor, they will probably look at this company in the same framework that they look at any other companies. And so it's a really, really huge uh, shift of uh, framework, I think. I think it's a good thing. Um, and, and so when I look forward and I see all this movement, I think it's brilliant that there is this consolidation of strategy. And I, I, I tend to agree with Tiago. I mean, we should not be afraid of having primes, otherwise we will not grow. And I think that's one leg to stand on. And I believe that's actually the only way to, to uh, go up the value chain. We know exactly how uh, European primes <laughs> look at us. I think you've put it extremely well. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I think I look forward to seeing the second leg, which is these people who decide to start companies bringing their own uh, space-based knowledge, but breaking the form, uh, like saying, if I can get an easy contract that fits my strategy, that's fine. I will not go against it. I think it may make a lot of sense, but I'm actually going to build 
this product, go to market with a strategy that investors that are not necessarily focused on space would understand and invest in. This is my view. This is what I think could be really cool, really interesting, and completely different from what we've seen so far, which would not have happened without this you know, path that has been uh, done to date. And so it's, it's really a pleasure to see what's going on, and, and I really hope to receive some pitch decks from really smart people that uh, decide to go the second route. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Rodolfo. It was a very interesting uh, answer. Just to wrap up and to finish up, just to have an, um, and I apologize, I was clearly too ambitious with this panel. I cannot have six people. I have to make it shorter with four so that I can ask questions. So it's a learning process. I apologize. But my last question uh, to Rodolfo will be, I mean, I look at this, uh, we talk about one, uh, one, uh, 1,000 millions. I mean, and this is financing that uh, is not 100%. So we are assuming here that we have within our industrial context the ability to invest that, either by own capitals or either by looking at venture capitals. My question and final is, do you think, uh, because this is something that we, we discuss in other areas, I mean, is the cultural, uh, the Portuguese culture is not very uh, willing to uh, take the risks, no? And, uh, for me, this sector, although very enthusiastic, is clearly a little bit of a known, particularly this new space. So do you think that the players that we want here in Portugal, they are really able to fund themselves in terms of the effort that they need to go forward with this? And if yes, I mean, are they able to get these funds from Portugal players like Armilar or so on? Or do they think, do they have to look a little bit broader and look at international players or what, what do you think it's the, the, the way here to, to achieve this? I mean, look, um, absolutely. If you're starting your business and looking for financing, look as broad as, as it's possible. I mean, when we look at deals, uh, these companies are looking at other VCs in another country. So it's, it's a, an absolutely open, open market. Um, but to answer your question directly, absolutely yes, in a qualified way, which is it really depends on um, the value proposition of the company and the fit with the investment fund. I don't think there's a lack of capital uh, for good startups. I would actually suggest it's a bit of the other way around. If you look at the multiple uh, venture capital funds that have come up with, uh, within the last, I don't know, two or three years, there's a lot of capital out there. The question is actually... I have a great deal of respect for, for the target that has been set for 2030. From a practical point of view, for an investor, I don't think it's very relevant in the sense that if I'm assessing a, a deal opportunity, the only thing I care, to be quite frank, is that company's value proposition. So the overall target is, is, is very um, has a lot of merit in it for multiple reasons. Uh, but from an investment point of view, actually, I just want to assess the value opportunity that can come from that specific company. And so that's, that's just the one thing I would say is perfect to have a strategy at a national level. It's crucial. But if you want to break out and go into a non-institutionalized world, you need to speak the same language. And that's about the value proposition you bring to the market. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rodolfo, for your, for your answers. I think it was a good and a critical analysis of what we are discussing. Uh, so I apologize again to all not to be able to ask you a couple more questions. I have it written here uh, five or six, but um, we, of course, this is just the one moment that we get together. So we'll have plenty of opportunities to continue this dialogue. And so I would like to thank all the panel for participating and uh, give, being available to discuss this very important uh, topic. Uh, and uh, I take the opportunity also to close the session for today because this is the last one. We're already 20 minutes uh, late. So please, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for having us during the day. Don't forget, tomorrow we is still another uh, big day for 80 days, focusing on other, um, other areas, but also very interesting and also continuing to have B2B opportunities for also Please, there's still time to go, try to find the right people to connect and schedule B2B meetings throughout the day tomorrow. So uh, thank you very much all again. And uh, this wraps up the session for today. Thank you.